Well, let's see how you did. I hope you didn't choose C. There is simply no such thing as an absolutely precise measurement. It's impossible. It's also not A. This has nothing to do with being careful. We assume that we are always careful when we make measurements. If you made a measurement and realized that you weren't careful, don't write it down, just redo the measurement. It's also not B. The uncertainty or the precision in the measurements has nothing to do with mistakes. We're going to assume that all our measurements are correct. That's another reason we make multiple measurements. It helps us catch our mistakes. If one of your measurements is very different from all the rest, chances are you made a mistake and you should discard that measurement. So it's D. There are going to be other things, in this case your reflexes, which will result in a larger uncertainty than is possible with the stopwatch. Your reflexes probably introduce an uncertainty in this measurement of several tenths of a second, in fact. So that's how things work for measurements. Something about our measurement process tells us our precision. Either we've taken the naive approach, or as we'll see next lecture, we've taken a better approach using statistics to get a best estimate and uncertainty. But now suppose we're going to take a bunch of measurements and calculate some other quantity from it. That calculated quantity will inherit uncertainty from the measurements that went into the calculation. So we need to know how we take a number of measurements carry them through a calculation to get a calculated result, and now since the measurements have limited precision, we want to know what the precision of the calculated result is. This is called propagating the significant figures through the calculation. You've likely seen the rules for propagation of sig figs in some other course, but I find many students are a little confused by them, so let's just go over them. Multiplication and division rule is that the number of sig figs of the answer when you multiply or divide should match the number of sig figs of the least precisely known number used in the calculation. The key phrase here is least precisely known. What does that mean? That means the number with the fewest sig figs. So let's do this calculation 3.69 and the calculator says 459.774. Okay, now what? Well, our least precisely known number is here. It only has three sig figs, this one has four, and so we need to round our answer to three sig figs. Everything after that is junk. So we will now round correctly. 459.7 is going to round to 460. And, you know, that's a little unclear, right? Is, is that zero a sig fig? Well, we know it is, but does our reader? So it would be better to write it as 4.60 times 10 to the 2. The addition and subtraction rule is the one where I find students tend to get more confused. So it says that the number of places after the decimal in the answer should match the places in the number with the fewest digits after the decimal. Now notice, we're no longer talking about significant figures. We're talking about places after the decimal. So, let's do one. And we can justify it. Think about that, that we're looking at the places after the decimal. Why? Well, if you think about here, this 1807.3 is the one with fewer places after the decimal. Now, if you were just doing this in elementary school or whatever, you would be taught to put zeros here and carry out your subtraction. But remember, the fact that we haven't put digits here doesn't mean they're zero. It means they're, in, they're not significant figures, and so we don't know what these digits are. And so question mark minus six is certainly still question mark. We don't know what it is. So when we carry out that subtraction, we're going to have a... Now, again, the calculator says 1802.724. So I'm going to write that all in. 
However, we already know that this 2-4 is garbage. We don't actually know those digits, and so we should be writing down 1802.7 as our final answer. We can justify this rule. I've already given you a brief justification, but here's another one. Think about these two numbers, 1807.3 and 4.576. If we don't actually know uncertainties in them, then our naive interpretation means that 1807.3 is actually some number between perhaps 1807.25 and 1807.35. And this 4.576 is really supposed to be a number somewhere between 4.5755 and 4.5765. So these are the ranges that we believe these numbers might actually lie in. So what is the range that we believe the subtraction should lie in? Well, the minimum believable is going to come from this one minus the larger one over here, right? And the maximum believable is going to come from this one minus the smaller one, right? So if you actually carry out those two subtractions, what you get is that your minimum believable result is 1802.6735. And your maximum believable result comes out to 18. 02.7745. What does that tell us? Well, in our maximum and minimum, we agree on the 1802. That we know for sure. And then we believe that this next digit is either a 6 or a 7. Well, that means we're not certain about it, but we've narrowed down the options. Now, what about this next digit? It's tempting to say, oh, look, we know it's a 7, but not so fast, because we believe we're in this range from 0.6735 to 0.7745, and so that means anything in there is fine, right? So 0 0.68 is fine, 0 0.69 is fine, 0 0.70, 0 0.71, those are all in that range. Well, that means we have no idea what this next digit is. It could be anything. And so we've just justified that the last digit we know anything about is this first digit after the decimal place. And that's exactly what the rule led us to keep as our least significant digit. I'm going to finish off this video lecture with what looks like perhaps a slightly different topic, estimation. But it's actually connected. A lot of the time when you're going to measure something, you sort of need to know roughly how big it is before you start the measurement, because that might influence your choice of measurement tools. Also, when you calculate something, it's good to be able to estimate it first so you know roughly how big it should be, so that if you make a serious error in your calculation, you might be able to catch it. So we're going to estimate the volume of water in Sydney Harbour. Now, first off, realize I have no idea what the volume of water is in Sydney Harbour. And if I were just to guess, I would almost certainly be very wrong. An estimate is not a guess. The point of an estimate is that you make a simple model that you use to calculate what you're trying to estimate from things whose values that you think you can guess reasonably well. So I'm going to make a simple model of Sydney Harbour. I'm going to say that it has some length, that I'll call little l, and it has some width, that I'm going to call w, and it has some depth d, and I'm going to say that the volume is just roughly the length times the width times the depth, which means I'm modeling it as just a big kind of rectangular box. Well, that's certainly wrong, but if I just want the rough order of magnitude of the volume of water, this should get me there. So I'm going to start with the length, because I think that's the easiest. 
because you've probably at some point driven from Sydney River up to New Waterford. And chances are the drive took you, I don't know, maybe half an hour or so, and you were probably going about 50 kilometers an hour most of the way, and so we could guess that's maybe 20 or 25 kilometers. So I'm going to say that this length is about 20 kilometers, 2 times 10 to the 4 meters. I'm going to work all in meters to keep things consistent. Next, next let's think about the width. Well, what might it be? It's certainly a lot bigger than a football field, right? And that's 100 meters. So is it more like one kilometer? Or is it more like 10 kilometers? It's certainly not more than that. Well, a useful thing to know is that if you're looking over water or flat land like the prairies or something, the horizon is around about five kilometers away. And if you're standing over here in South Bar looking over at North Sydney, it is not off on the distant horizon. So I'm going to say that it is closer to one kilometer, and so the width is roughly one times ten to the three meters. Okay, the depth is a little harder, right? One meter? I doubt it. Ten meters? Well, maybe. A hundred meters? Well, maybe. It's certainly not a kilometer. Well, I think it's about ten meters, and here's my reasoning. They've had to dredge it to let big ships come in. If it was typically a hundred meters deep in most places, they wouldn't have had to dredge it. So I think the depth is about 10 meters. And so now I can estimate the volume because it's just the length times the width times the depth. And that's four, seven, eight. So two times 10 to the eight meters cubed. Whenever you calculate any number, you should always think about it and make sure you believe it. So for example, if you're calculating a speed, you might compare it to speeds you know like walking speed, speed on a highway, things like that to get an idea of how it compares. So let's compare our answer for Sydney, Nova Scotia's har harbour with something we can look up, like the volume of Sydney, Australia's harbour. So Wikipedia, which for something simple and factual like this is probably pretty correct, says that the Sydney, Australia harbour is 562 million meters cubed, and so that's 5.62 times 10 to the 8 meters cubed, and so we're in the same order of magnitude, and that means our answer is probably pretty believable.